Welcome everybody to the, this is the third celebration of the best projects in the Northwest of England. Uh, I will ask delegates to please switch off their cameras and their microphones when uh, Rachel and Jean are talking. Um, so each, each person will speak for 25 minutes and then there will be five minutes uh, for questions. Okay, so Rachel, if you would like to start sharing your screen, Fantastic. And as I say, we will all we will all switch off our cameras and we'll mute ourselves. And when you have five minutes remaining, I will switch my camera back on again. Okay. Okay. So you ready to go, Rachel? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Speak speak to you in a bit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So my name is Rachel Campbell. I'm a former math student at the University of Manchester. And my project was on the geometry of hyperbolic knots and links, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in my presentation today. So to start with, I'll go over a few aims and objectives of the project and in this presentation as well. So the aim is basically just to study how hyperbolic geometry can be used in knot theory and to break that down into some objectives. I'm going to define knots, links, their complements and what makes two knots or links the same. Um, I'm going to go over which knots have hyperbolic complements. I'm going to show a method of determining the geometry of a hyperbolic knot or link complement. And then once we've found that, we can find its geometric properties. And finally, I'm going to look for hyperbolic knots in the space T times I and see how the volume of their complements varies depending on certain other properties. So first of all, I'll start by defining the knot. So in the intuitive sense, you would think of a knot as basically like a piece of string that's tied together in a certain way. And that's basically what the mathematical definition says, but here it is more formally. So it says a knot is an embedding of a circle into the three sphere S3. So this space S3, you can basically think of this as being very similar to the real three dimensional space, like the space that you would use in many real life applications, but it, it's also got the point at infinity in it. So when we say it's an embedding of a circle, what that means is if we take our piece of string and tie it together and form a knot, we have to attach the endpoints of the strings together. So basically we get a full loop of the string and that's where the circle comes from in this definition. So, so to go over some examples, here's the unknot, which is basically the simplest not we can draw because when we draw it on a piece of paper, it doesn't cross over itself at all. It's just a circle. Now, another type of knot, which is a bit more complicated is the trefoil knot shown here. And this one crosses over itself three times when we draw it. And we cannot possibly draw it crossing over itself less than three times. So we say that it has three crossings and its crossing number is three. And finally, another knot here is the figure eight knot which is named for this eight shape that it has in the middle here. And that crosses over itself four times. So what about a link? Well, this is defined in a similar way to a knot. We say that a link is an embedding of a union of disjoint circles in S3. So basically you can think of that as several knots embedded in the same space. So for example, this is the hop link. This consists of two unknots embedded in the same space and these cross over each other. And another example, the L6A5 link, which is the hop link with one extra component added here. So in the objectives list, I talked about what makes two knots or links the same. So in knot theory, we don't actually use the word the same. We use the word equivalent instead, but it basically means a similar thing. So we say that two knots or links are equivalent if we can obtain one by homotoping the other in S3. So what that means is basically you can move the strand throughout the space the same way you would move a knot strand in real life. So you can't cut it up, you can't glue the strands together in any weird way and you can't have them pass through each other, but otherwise you can move it about however you want. So I've got an example of that here. I think it's easier to see with an example. So this knot on the left is equivalent to the knot on the right and we can see that by imagining this strand here imagine it coming out of the page in the direction of the red arrow and when it does it will cross over like this 
and if we move these strands slightly we'll get back this knot which is a trefoil knot so this knot is actually equivalent to a trefoil knot. So now I'm going to talk about the knot all link complement and the complement is basically the space S3 with the knot all link itself removed so that's a three-dimensional space and because it's three-dimensional whereas the knot all link itself is one-dimensional we can do a lot more interesting things with geometry in the complement. So there's a theorem called the gordon lewecki theorem, and this says that two knots are equivalent if and only if their complements are homeomorphic. So what this is saying is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between knots and their complements, so they're really closely related to each other, and we can use complements to determine whether two knots are equivalent. Unfortunately, that doesn't apply to links, so we can only use that for knots. So I'm going to talk about the knots that have hyperbolic complements. So to talk about hyperbolic geometry in three dimensions, we start by looking at this hyperbolic three space, which is denoted H3. So this is what we call the upper half space, I think, or half plane. And it's basically this complex plane, the product of that with the positive real line. So it's all the points above this complex plane, but not including the complex plane. So when we are defining geometry, we have to also define the distances in the space as well as just the space itself. So to sort of explain that, I'm going to look at the length of an infinitesimal vector, let's say dx, dy, dt, located at some point x, y, t in this space. And the length of that will be this formula here. So if we were working in Euclidean space, which is the basic geometry that most people will encounter first, we don't have the t squared at the bottom, but otherwise it looks the same. So what this t squared is doing is that when t gets higher and you get further away from the complex plane, the lengths will get smaller. So one way to visualize distances in this space is to look at the geodesics. These are the paths of shortest length in the space. So I've got some geodesics in this diagram here. So for example, if we have two points in the space that are on the same vertical line, the path of shortest length between them, the geodesic, is just the vertical line between them. So that feels quite intuitive, that's what you might expect. But it gets more interesting if you have two points that aren't in the same vertical line. So for example, these two points here, the path of shortest length between them is actually the arc of a semicircle, and that semicircle has to be drawn so that it meets the complex plane at a right angle. And that's a bit less intuitive, but it happens because the distances get shorter the further away from the complex plane you get. So it so if you go a bit higher from this point, the distances get a bit shorter. So that's why it's not just a horizontal line. So I'm going to go over what makes a not a link complement hyperbolic now. So basically the complement is hyperbolic if it's locally isometric to an open ball in that space H3. So what this means is if we take a knot complement, let's say the figure eight knot complement, which is hyperbolic, we can take a point in this and surround it by an open ball. And this will be isometric to an open ball in the space H3. So basically these spaces locally look the same, but overall they're not the same, of course. So there's a theorem called Thurston's hyperbolization theorem. And this says that a knot is hyperbolic if and only if it's not a torus knot and it's not a satellite knot. So that's quite a powerful theorem because basically if we know whether a knot is a torus knot or a satellite knot, then we can determine whether it's, hyper it's got a hyperbolic complement. So a torus knot is a knot that can be embedded onto the surface of a torus. So in this diagram here, the dashed line is a torus, which is basically like a donut shape and the solid line is not being drawn on the surface of that. So this line is actually another way to draw the trefoil knot, which means that the trefoil knot is a torus knot. And a satellite knot is a knot that can be embedded into a neighborhood of a non-trivial knot. So this example here, the blue dashed line is a neighborhood of the figure eight knot. So you might recognize it has that eight shape in the middle, just like the figure eight knot, except it's a three dimensional neighborhood surrounding the knot. And in here, we've drawn a different knot shown in black here. And this isn't the same as the figure eight knot, it's a different knot embedded in its neighborhood. 
So this knot is actually a satellite knot by this definition. So if you're given a knot at random, the chances are it's not going to be a torus knot and it's not going to be a satellite knot. So the chances are it will be actually a hyperbolic knot, which means that hyperbolic ge geometry can be applied to a lot of knot complements and it can be used to study a lot of knots as a result. So how do we actually determine the geometry of a hyperbolic knot? Well, one way to do this is to triangulate it. So that means we decompose the complement into ideal tetrahedra. And we need to make sure that the faces of these glue together to form back the initial knot or link complement. And we can embed these ideal tetrahedra in H3. And if we can do that in a way such that this gluing forms a hyperbolic manifold, then that means that the initial link, not all link complement must be a hyperbolic manifold as well. So we found a hyperbolic structure for that complement. So just to get an idea of what an ideal tetrahedra in H3 actually looks like, it's something that's got four vertices on the boundary of the space. So the boundary is the complex plane and the point at infinity. So in this example, we've got the tetrahedra, tetrahedron with points, three points at the complex plane and another vertex at the point at infinity and the lines between them are the geodesics, the path sort of shortest length. And that's what forms a tetrahedron in H3. So one example of a triangulation that I've got is the triangulation of the figure eight knot complement, which is as shown here. So this has two, two tetrahedra in its triangulation. And these are a bit tricky to visualize as tetrahedra at first, but you just have to imagine this space D is wrapping underneath the other faces, and it's more easy to see it as a tetrahedron. And as well as where all the vertices of the tetrahedra are embedded, we also have information about how these are glued in this diagram. So faces with matching letters are glued together. And also the edges around faces, they have the same pattern as you go around them. So for example, let's look at face B. On the left, we have this arrow with no line going forward first. Then we have the double line arrow going backwards and then the double line arrow going forwards. And on this side, we have the same pattern. We have the arrow with no line going forwards, then the double line backwards, then the double line forwards. So when we do the glue, we make sure that the corresponding edges in this pattern are the ones that are glued together. And when we glue these together like that, we get back the figure eight knot complement. So we know about the geometry of the hyperbolic three space H3. So as these are tetrahedra embedded in that, we know about the geometry of these tetrahedra. And as the figure eight knot complement is just these glued together, we now know more about the geometry of that knot complement as well. However, there is a potential problem with this. So the, there are several ways to form a triangulation of a not all link complement. And you might think it's possible to glue the, glue the different tetrahedra together in various different ways and get various different geometric structures with various different geometric properties. However, this can't happen by this theorem, most of preserved rigidity. This says that the hyperbolic structure given to a not all link complement is actually unique. So no matter how we triangulate the complement, when we glue these tetrahedra back together, we always get the same space. So that means geometric properties of hyperbolic not all link complements are actually well defined. So we can find the properties such as volume without having to worry about this. So let's look at how we find the volume. The volume of a not all link complement is just the sum of the volumes of the ideal tetrahedra in its triangulation. So all we need to do is find the volume of the tetrahedra. So going back to the example of the figure eight knot complement, this consisted of two tetrahedra in its triangulation and each of these had a volume of about 1.015. So the total volume was these two added together, which is about 2.03. So now having found that some geometric properties of these not all link complements, I'm going to deviate a bit and look at hyperbolic knots in a different space, T times I rather than S3. So what T times I is, is T, the torus, taking the, the product of that with the interval I. So the torus is two dimensional, it's the surface of a donut, basically. And what the interval does to that is it basically thickens that surface and makes it 3D so that we can draw knots within that. So you can sort of think of that as a hollow donut to make it a bit easier to visualize, which is 
shown in this diagram here. But the question is, how do we actually find hyperbolic knots in this space? Well, first of all, to think about that, I'm going to actually talk about what the complement of the unknot is. So it turns out that the complement of the unknot is a solid torus, which is represented by the disk D2 and the product of that with the circle S1. So visualizing that is a bit tricky, but I've got a diagram that hopefully helps with that. So this is our unknot, and we want to find what the complement is, basically all the points in S3 that aren't included in this circle. So we've got the disk D2 here for filling in this circle. And for each point in this disk, we can actually draw a circle that fills the entire complement. So I've got the diagram showing this here. So for example, if you take the point in the middle of this disk, you can draw a circle going from the point at infinity back to the point at infinity. And if we take, for example, this point here, we can draw a circle filling the complement like this. And if we take all those circles combined, we fill up the entire complement of the unknot. So that means that the complement is the product of this disk D2 with the circle S1, which is a solid torus. So now we have to consider the hop link. So this is two copies of the unknot. So basically what we're doing is we're drawing an extra unknot within the unknot complement, aka the solid torus. So the hot blink complement is basically the solid torus with this unknot removed. Here's a solid torus. And if you remove the unknot from the middle, you get this hollow torus, basically. Sorry, the hollow donut, which is the space T times I. So the complement of the hot blink is actually T times I. So we can use this to find knots in T times I, because if we now consider this example, this is the L6A5 link, and this is a hot link plus one extra component. So once again, we're drawing this extra component in the complement of the hot link, which is T times I. So that means it's not in T times I. So any link consisting of the hot link plus one extra component will represent a knot in T times I. So I basically use this idea to try and find as many hyperbolic knots in T times I as I could. And I use a computer program called Snappy to do that because this has a tabulation stored in it of all links in S3 going up to 14 crossings. So I could get it to look at all those links and find which ones had a hyperbolic complement and also which ones consisted of the hot link plus one extra component. And all the links that did have both those things were hyperbolic knots in T times I. So with this method, I found about 18,000 hyperbolic knots in T times I, and I put them in a table as well, just for easy reference. So for example, I've got a, the first few rows of this table here. It's got the initial link name in it in S3. So we've got the L6A5 link here, which we already knew was a knot in T times I. It's also got the number of crossings in the link. It's got the volume of the complement. And finally, this column is the number of tetrahedra in the triangulation of the complement. But because we can triangulate a complement in various different ways, it's the minimum number of tetrahedra out of all the possible triangulations. So that's what this column is showing. So having found the table with all this information, I thought it would be interesting to look into any patterns concerning the volume of these of the complements of these hyperbolic knots in T times I. So I started by looking at it against the number of crossings. So this is a swarm chart and it shows distributions of volumes with each number of crossings. So this is showing that in general, the volume is increasing with the number of crossings, but we do have some points, for example, around here where there's a large number of crossings and the volume is still quite small. For example, this volume about 5.5 .5 is repeating itself a lot. So that seemed a bit strange at first. So I looked into that, I asked, I basically asked the table for all the hyperbolic knots in T times I whose complement had volume less than six. And this same volume came up over and over again, 5.333. So the reason that actually happens is that I'm going to explain in the next slide. So if you recall the gordon lewicki theorem, this said that two knots are equivalent if and only if their complements are homeomorphic. However, it didn't apply to links in S3. And that's what we're looking at in this table, basically. So that means that in this table, we might have two non-equivalent links that have the same complement, which means their complements are going to have the same volume. 
Unfortunately, the program Snappy, it's able to look out for any of these isometric link complements, basically the complements that are the same, and remove all the duplicates. So I did remove all the duplicates and I kept whichever link had the least number of crossings. And I redrew this graph. And overall, the trend still looks the same. The volume is increasing with the number of crossings, but these extra points around here have been removed because all those links whose complement had the volume 5.333, they were all just, they all have the same complement as the L6A5 link shown here. So this isn't actually the strongest correlation. So I was wondering if there might be something that had a stronger pattern. So I looked at the volume against the number of tetrahedra in the triangulation as well. And I, this yielded quite an interesting swarm chart because the correlation between these two factors is much stronger here. And on this graph, I've also drawn this straight line, which is y equals 1.015x. Now this number is actually the maximum possible volume of an ideal tetrahedron embedded in H3. So that means that these points cannot possibly go above that line or else one of the tetrahedron, the triangulation would have a volume more than this number, which is impossible. So what's interesting is that these points do stick quite cl quite close to the line, but as we get to a large number of tetrahedra, they do start to deviate away from it a bit. So having gone through all that, I'll go through some of the conclusions that I came to in my project and also as part of this presentation. So first of all, knots have a hyperbolic complement if and only if they're not torus knots and not satellite knots, so that was Thurston's hyperbolization theorem. Also, we can decompose not all link complements into ideal tetrahedra, and we can use that to find the geometric properties of the complement, for example, the volume. And we've learned that we can find knots in T times I using what we know about links in S3. And for these hyperbolic knots in T times I that we found, there's a trend of volume increasing with the number of crossings, and there's an even stronger trend of volume increasing with the number of tetrahedra in the triangulation as well. So to finish off this presentation, I thought I'd quickly go through some of the work I was thinking about doing on this project, but I didn't really have time for. So first of all, I could have looked into knots in other spaces. So in this presentation, we just looked at knots in S3 or in T times I, but I could have looked at another space, for example, the solid torus. We know that's the unknot complement. So we're not in the solid torus would be the unknot with one extra component added. Similarly, I could also have looked at links in T times I rather than just not. So that would be the hot link plus several other components instead of restricting ourselves just to one. And finally, I could have looked at it in a completely different way and tried to find knots directly using the rep this representation of T times I here, which is, you might recognise this as the general representation of the torus and the interval I just adds some depth to, the depth to this so that we can have not crossing over itself. And yeah, you can find knots in this space, for example, the one shown here. And this is how it looks in S3. And it has a lot of crossings as a link in S3, whereas it has actually no crossings when it's drawn directly in T times I, which is quite interesting. So I could have tried to find all the different ways the knot could cross over itself, no times, one time, two times in this form, etc. But that would be quite difficult because I, I've already thought that there are absolutely infinitely many ways it could cross over itself zero times in this representation. So it might be quite difficult to find all the combinations, but that's definitely something interesting I could have looked into further if I'd had more time. And so that concludes the presentation and I hope you enjoyed it and learned something about not theory. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, we'll open up for questions in a few minutes. That, that was absolutely yep. fantastic. Thank you for taking Thank the you. time. You no, know, because I'm, I'm sure you've forgotten a lot of this with starting <laughs> work. I'll, I'll kick off, just ask a quick question. So more and more universities around the world now are setting up these digi labs. I'm sure you've heard of these digi labs where we're gonna have three dimensional data capture and visualization. And have you ever had a go at the vir virtual reality? No, no. I was just wondering if you can imagine, you know, in the future, you can imagine, you know, giving this talk with the virtual reality and you'd be able to do everything. In yeah, that, space. yeah, that would that will possibly make things easier unless it would be really hard to set up the visualization in 3D. Well, yeah, well, one of the yeah. hardest things about this was trying to visualize all these three dimensional things and trying to figure out how things should work and what things should go where. 
If you haven't had a go on the three dimensional, <laughs> the, 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 the virtual reality headsets, they are unbelievable. Honestly, yes. it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. So, you know, I'm sure in the future, students will be able to give these these presentations, you know, virtually and, and yeah. understand yeah. things a lot more clearly. Okay, sorry, I've, I've taken too much time, right? Is, would anybody like, else like to ask Rachel a question? We do have quite a bit of time. Yes, I've got a question. Yeah, okay. go ahead, Massimo. Yeah, I've got a question. It's Massimo. Uh, now, I am a surgeon, so uh, I've got, uh, I'm an amateur because I'm interested in mathematics. I'm also part of a multidisciplinary group with clinician engineers. We do research, uh, practically uh, in computational fluid dynamics applied to the cardiovascular system. Now, I was just wondering, as an amateur and also as a complete ignorant, because I've heard about not the theory, but I'm not really very familiar. Uh, is, is there any room for uh, no theory uh, as an application to the biomedical field? For example, oh, not... DNA structure or even the structure of the vascular system, uh, the, the, the structure of the wall of the of, of a vessel. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question because the applications of not theory kind of go beyond this project, but I did look into it a little bit. I didn't see anything about its applications in biology, but it sounds it seems like it could have applications in that. So what I saw was actually it had some applications in quantum physics because you can use the way a particle moves throughout the space and it might form a knot. So I thought that sounded quite interesting. And actually, there was something with biology. It just wasn't the same topic as what you mentioned. I think it can be used in, in applications in DNA as well because DNA has that double helix structure. And I think yeah, yeah. there are some knots in that and not they can be applied to that mm. field. For example, the heart uh, yeah. can be considered a double helix in his geometry, in its geometry. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, could the no theory <laughs> be applied to further study it? I don't know. I'm just thinking. Yeah, I, I don't know either, to be fair, in that particular case, but it seems like it could be definitely, yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. And uh, do you know if there is anybody doing something uh, something uh, related to this, uh, or is it just something really completely new? No, I don't know, I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. It was just my curiosity. <laughs> no, it was a really good question. <laughs> okay, thank you, Massimo. Is, is there anybody else? Would anybody else like to ask a question? I think uh, if I could just ask Rachel, you know, you, yeah. you're using that software. Is that written yeah. in a particular language or is it based it's, anywhere? Yeah, it basically uses Python because it's called Snappy. So you kind of write the last two letters, PY, that forms Python. Uh, so yeah, it uses Python. Oh, great. And that's so it's all open source. So was it developed yeah. at a particular university or? I don't know. I, I remember seeing pages on it I think it was from the University of Chicago but I don't know if that's where it was developed or if that's just where they'd written pages about the documentation I'm not sure okay thank you very much Rachel you you can relax now but, <laughs> we know it was a fantastic talk it is recorded thank you so I'm sure you know you'll be able to get to get hold of the recording okay if you'd like to stop uh, if you'd like to uh, yeah so Jean would you like to sh start sharing your screen um yeah, yeah, just... Uh... And, and as I said, I'll switch off my camera, but then I'll mm -hmm. switch it back on, you know, when, when you're about 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So over to you then, John. Do you see it? Is it... Is it... Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm John. I'm from the University of Liverpool. Um, I just graduated, but I'm, I also just started again. I'm a first-year PhD student. I'm studying math specifically uh, this stuff that I'm gonna introduce right now. Um, so the title of my project, my master's project was um, Higher Spin Bundles on Hyperelliptic Cream and Surfaces, right? And the title might seem intimidating, but it's actually not as bad. You know, I discovered that Riemann surfaces were not as complicated as I thought they would be. 
um, at least to um, kind of understand them a little bit. So our story starts with spinners actually. So spinners are special functions um, whose existence on the space depends on its geometry. So, I mean, most of the time when we're studying things in math, we usually study, we start with a set and then we study functions on that set, right? So for example, when we want to do real analysis or so analysis of the real numbers, we study the functions on the real numbers. We differentiate them, integrate them, do this, do that, differential equations. Um, and so spinners are special functions and they exist on a specific um, type of spaces called manifold. Um, and a Riemann surface is an example of a manifold and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, the motivation for spinners actually comes from physics and stuff like when, when you're trying to calculate the curvature of things and singularity theory. So like in math, when there is like a, a problem, like a, a, uh, an equation or something that behaves a little bit weird in specific points, they usually are called singularities. So what we would like to do is to find all the spaces, right? All the sets that can have those functions in them, right? Because this is again, important in string theory. I, um, I went to a school for string theory in a summer school. And you know they keep they keep adding new dimensions um, to the to the theory. And um, the thing about those dimensions I noticed is that they are specific. Like they would add them in, and they're they would need to have specific properties that would help their theory, right? And spinners are part of that. So in this project, we focus on one particular space, and this is the the Riemann surfaces, right? So what are Riemann surfaces? A Riemann surface is, I would like, in your head, I would like you to picture just any 2D surface. So a torus, like we had before with Rachel, um, is a Riemann surface, actually. A sphere is a Riemann surface. A, um, a pretzel can be a Riemann surface. A fidget spinner is a Riemann surface. You can also have the complex plane, that's a Riemann surface. And, um, the main point about these surfaces, right? What makes them Riemann surfaces is an added structure that we that we put on the surface, right? And so I like to think of the structure as us having stickers, right? So imagine having a complex plane and then you get a sticker, like you cut off the complex plane and then you stick it on the surface. And so you cover the surface with a bunch of different complex planes. And what you get, that's that's what that's when you get a Riemann surface, right? So the way you stick them actually needs to be a little bit more um, more specific, right? And the most important part is that whenever you stick them together, whenever you put the stickers, clearly they're going to overlap at some places. This overlap, right? As you can see here in the diagram, right? So we have W and U, two sets, which correspond to these sets here in the complex plane. Now, um, where they overlap, we, we can now define a function, right? So the way the stickers are working is basically we have a function that says this sticker is the same as this bar on the complex plane. That's what a sticker, like that's how we stick them, right? By using a function. So now we have, if you look at this space here, right? This, this in intersection in the middle, you see that if we have a point here on the complex plane, we can go backwards to the Riemann surface, right? So you see theta here, we can go backwards. So the inverse of theta. So theta and, and, and phi need to be um, bijective. They need to be bijective homeomorphisms, meaning they the U here and the U on the complex plane need to be, you need to be in one-to-one -one correspondence, right? They need to be the same amount of points. There's nothing extra, nothing less. So if you go from here, from this part, which is in, in the W part of the complex plane, and then you go backwards to the Riemann surface, then you take the other route to go here, right? You see now we have a function that's going from the complex plane to the complex plane. 
right? And what's the first thing you think about when you think about complex functions? So it's just a, it's a, just a normal complex function, right? Um, we think about derivative and differentiation, the most important part about complex analysis, which is the, 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 the complex derivative, right? And when a function does have that, we call it holomorphic. And so Riemann surfaces need to have those holomorphic transition functions. So we call them transition because we're transitioning from sticker W to sticker U. Um, I should be saying stickers as much because they are officially called charts. And um, yeah, so they're called charts. So the W chart and the U chart and to transition between them where there is an intersection that needs to be holomorphic, right? Now, what does this allow us to do? Why are we doing this? Because complex analysis um, is very powerful, like because of the complex derivative has so many um, implication on the behavior of the function, complex analysis tools are very powerful. And you can do so many things from very basic um, axioms, from very basic assumptions, right? And now that we have done the, re now that we have patched the, re the Riemann surface with these complex planes, we can actually do complex analysis on the Riemann surface, right? And so, um, a few things to talk about with Riemann surfaces before we get into the, the functions is um, we will only consider compact Riemann surfaces. So compactness just means it doesn't go to infinity. So like the complex plane as a Riemann surface is not going to be considered, but the sphere would be considered. The donut, the torus will be considered, this double torus, I think that's what it's called, will be considered because they're all, they all finite. They don't extend to infinity. And we call the number of holes the genus of the surface. And this is very important because in topology, those Riemann surfaces, if they have the same genus to a topologist, they are exactly the same. It's that, it's that whole mug and donut being the same thing. That is the same thing here as well. It's the same exact correspondence. So a, a very important Riemann surface is the Riemann sphere. The Riemann sphere is is just it's a it's a sphere, right? But we're gonna put re, uh, we're gonna put complex plane coordinates on it, and we do that by by making the the south pole zero, and the north pole is actually a, a point that we add to the complex numbers, when we call it infinity. This can be made into a complex plane by doing the charts so that. The first chart, the, the W, for example, we would ignore the point at infinity and we just have just a complex plane, right? Because we only add one point to it. And for the other chart, the, the U chart, let's say, we would ignore the zero and then we have a comp the same complex plane, but it's just different names, right? And then you see how we can this can be mapped into the complex plane and then we get, a, sorry, we get a complex structure on it. A Riemann surface structure. Um, this is, of course, compact, and this has genus zero because there's no holes in it. So, how we draw the complex plane on the surface defines its geometry. That's what makes the Riemann surface, right? It's not the genus; it's the the how we put the complex plane. And um, one important class of Riemann surfaces is the hyperelliptic ones, and those are what we're going to be talking to, what we're going to be talking about soon. Um, Another thing that we need to introduce a little bit beforehand is the meromorphic functions on C. So um, I think holomorphic people know what that means. Um, and it's honestly, it just means complex differentiable. You can get at the derivative. The derivative is fully defined on, um, on those functions. Now a meromorphic function is the function that is holomorphic. So it's, it's good in mostly, right? But mostly is the key point, is that in finitely many points, it's not holomorphic, right? But it is something that is that we can handle, right? And that something is that it goes to infinity. So what we see is at those specific points, we can kind of consider the function to be, the output of the function to be the point at infinity, right? Um, of course, that point is does not exist on the complex plane, but it kind of it tends to go there. And these functions, um, 
the most important part about them that we care about for this for this application is their zeros and their poles. A zero of the function is whenever the function is zero, and a pole is whenever the function is going to infinity. So the, the poles are actually the fun where the function is not holomorphic, right? So we can actually define meromorphic functions or even surfaces, just like we did for the complex plane. Now, the only little part here, the only main difference is that to define, like to analyze them properly, like I said, um, we need to kind of go back to the charts, right? So where the function, uh, to see if a function is meromorphic, it needs to be meromorphic on the chart. If we look at this um, picture down here, right? We see that there is this set here, that is this patch or this sticker is down here, right? And we have the function that maps this point x to f of x on the complex plane. This is a function, right? Now to check if it's meromorphic, we look at the patch or the sticker that contains x. We see where it goes on the complex plane. And now we have something that goes from the complex plane to the Riemann surface back to the complex plane. Again, another complex valued function on the complex plane, AKA a function that we're used to. And which, which now we can call meromorphic, which we have a definition for. And we use that same definition. So the function is meromorphic if it's meromorphic on every patch, right? And you, you're gonna see that a lot with Riemann surfaces is that every time we wanna do analysis or something, we go back to the patches, right? We break down the surface into these little patches and analyze what we want to analyze, right? And because we made the transition between the patches holomorphic, it doesn't really affect any of the theory. So that's why this is really important. And another very important key fact is that for compact surfaces, it turns out that the number of zeros with their orders is equal to the number of poles with their orders. So if we have, let's say just simple, it's just simple zeros, so no squared, no cubed. Um, in the function, like when you think about polynomials and cubes and zeros. Um, if you have five points on the surface going to zero, you're going to have five points on the surface, another five points on the surface going to the poles. And um, yeah, so that's, that's a really important fact for compact surfaces. And again, this is another thing that makes that makes us concentrate on compact surfaces first before we deal with the general Riemann surfaces. It makes it easier to deal with. So complex line bundles. So this is where the spinners are gonna come in, right? The first thing we need to talk about is graphs, right? So when we want to study real functions, we graph them. It's it's very easy, it's very simple. It's the, one of the first things we learn to do with functions because it's, um. It's nice. We can see it. We can see um, where the the minima are, the, the the turning points are. We can see where the function is zero. We can see if the function goes to infinity. It's it's very nice, right? But the problem is, well, how do we do that for Riemann surfaces? Because Riemann surfaces are two dimensional. The functions are going to the complex plane. Another two dimensions. We don't have four dimensions, and so. One way I like to think about the way to study them is, um, I have this, this picture. Um, I like to think about it like this. We put a person on every point on the surface. Let's say we have infinitely many people. Each of them, they're gonna hold a, a complex plane in their hand. And then like, it's, it's, you know, imagine it to be infinite. And then what, what they're gonna do is, we're gonna give them a function. Each of them are going to be recording what the value of the function is on where they're standing. So I'm standing at this point here. I'm going to record, okay, so this point has f of f of z is equal to five. I'm gonna put five. The other person puts i plus one and they're gonna put i plus one. So they all write their, you know, they all record their values on their sheets, right? And then we just bring the sheets together, we collect them and then glue them together to form a picture, right? Um, this is just in th in theory a way to think about it. But it's not actually something that can be done easily in practice. Um, 
but it's it's one way to think about the graphing aspect of it, right? And so a complex line bundle, by definition, is a space that locally, so it's just like with the Raymond surface locally, it looked like a complex plane. This one locally looks like what, whatever the Riemann surface is. So let's say it's this surface. Locally looks like this surface, but times C. So there is a C plane, a C, uh, sorry, a, yeah, a, a complex plane on every point, right? And that's where the image of those people, every single person on every point holding a complex plane of, of their own. Now, and, the, and when we tell them to mark their sheets, and when we bring the sheets together and glue, uh, and glue them, the marking of those sheets, um, when we select a function, for example, that is called a section on the complex line bundle. Now, and the gluing you can imagine, right? If we have just a bunch of sheets and they all have a point on them, well, how do we glue them together, right? And the different gluings actually correspond to the different complex line bundles. And it turns out that the, the gluing is very, it's a very important aspect of it, right? Because if the functions, um, not every function can be graphed coherently or smoothly with every gluing. So specific ways to glue are specific for different functions in a way. Um, and so we come to divisor. So when you think about those complex line bundles, right? How do we even start to construct them? How do we even start to describe them? Well, it turns out that we don't actually, for us, we don't need to do too much to, to describe a complex line bundle. Um, and to do that, we look at divisors. So a divisor is, um, I can just tell anybody, go select any number of points on the surface let's say point P1, P2, and Q, right? And then attach an integer value to each point, say three minus five and eight, right? And then here, we, I, wrote, I wrote it here. You, we usually write them in this form. It's just, it's just a representation. There is no actual addition or subtraction happening. Um, this is a divisor, that's it. That's what a divisor is. It's just a linear combination of points. And, um, we can also assign a divisor to every meromorphic function. And that divisor is simply the zeros and the poles. So as you can see here, if you look at this function, this has a zero at some, some point called Z1 and another zero at some point called Z2. Now, if you look at the seven, this is saying the zero is of order seven. And then the zero, the other zero is of order two. And then when you look at the minuses, that's where the poles are. Um, so the the pole there's three poles. You see P P one P two P three. Each of them have a different order. And if you look at the sum of the integers themselves, so seven plus two is nine. Minus three minus two minus four is minus nine. They add up to zero, and that's where we go back to those functions being having the same number of poles and zeros, right? Um, like I said, it's it's with their order. So in here, it doesn't have the same number, but they but when the or, when you add up the orders, you get the same number. So now every divisor can be used to construct a holomorphic line bundle, right? And every holomorphic line bundle corresponds to a set of equivalent divisors. So when are divisors equivalent? Well, when their when their difference is a meromorphic function divisor, right? So again, that's why those functions are so powerful and needed because they tell us basically when things are equal to each other, when things give us the same holomorphic line bundle. And here holomorphic, I shouldn't be, I should have defined it. Holomorphic just means that the gluings are holomorphic, right? Yet again, we need to, we need to ma make sure that we're, we're working with spaces that are nice and smooth. So there is something called the canonical bundle. Every Riemann surface has a canonical bundle, right? And in the same way, it has a canonical class of divisors. Of course, they're all equivalent because they correspond to the same bundle, right? These divisors have degree equal to two G minus two. So degree is just the sum that we remember when I did the, when I summed up those coefficients, those integers, that's what the degree is. 
So the, it's canonical because the way to construct this bundle is actually using the charts on the surface. So we're using something that's in the surf that's baked into the surface definition to construct the bundle. And that's why it's canonical and unique. Um, and they actually correspond to the derivatives of those transition functions. When I remember when I said they go from the complex plane to the complex plane, their derivatives can give us the canonical line bundle. So what is an M spin bundle? An M spin bundle is if you have a divisor here and you multiply it by a positive integer greater than or equal to two, and let's say you have a divisor D, you multiply it by four, and then somehow you happen to get a divisor that's actually one of the canonical ones, right? The D down corresponds to some bundle. Of course, every, every divisor corresponds to a bundle. Now, what is that bundle? That bundle is called an M spin bundle, right? Um, and M spin bundles are where we are going to graph our M spinners. So if they exist, if there is an M spin bundle, which they, there is no guarantee that there is an M spin bundle, um, there, it is guaranteed a, a, uh, a, um, it, only if certain conditions are met. Uh, and so we have, if we have an M spin bundle, then we have a, then we can have an M spin divisor. So basically we're kind of in a way looking at the way to graph things to, to prove to us that we can find those functions, right? So we saw that there is, let's say, x, y axis, and then we inferred that maybe th there exists functions that go from the like from the real line to the real line. In the same way, we have this, and um, yeah. So that's what that is. Uh, of course, here there is. It's known that there are m to the two g distinct m spin structures on Riemann surfaces. So hyperelliptic surfaces, which is what I focused on. These can be defined by, by the two, well, either one of the, of the two equations. They define different ones. Um, these P point, th these are just complex numbers. So the solutions to these equations give us a surface, right? Something that we can st stick our complex planes on it and we get a, a Riemann surface. But the surface won't be compact. As you can imagine, we can increase X to infinity. We can increase Y to infinity. Um, we compactify it by adding one or two points, depending on which equation we used. And the point, the P points are actually called, are very special and they're called Weierstrass points. And if, if we're using the first one where we have two G plus one, there's actually two G plus two Weierstrass points. And the extra point is the infinity point. Um, but in this one, they're all the p, all the p, the, they're all listed here on in the equation. So my results, it turns out that we can. Um, so from what I learned is that we can we can describe all the two spin divisors, aka all the two spin bundles, in terms of only the Weierstrass points. So we only need two g plus two points, which is like it's nothing compared to the infinite number of points to describe all the two spin bundles, right? And that's what they would look like here. Um, and then for higher spin, so there was some roadblocks. I showed that for higher spin, the existence of the bundles, um, sorry, that's not something that I showed. Um, it's, um, it's known that it's, it depends on a divisibility condition. And uh, it depends on that two G minus two situation. It needs to be divisible. Right, so if two g minus two is not divisible by three, then you cannot have a three spin bundle. And furthermore, now this one I did show in my um, project, which is it's impossible to describe the four spin divisors in terms of only Weierstrass points. So we need to look at other points. And to look at other points, we need to look at the functions because remember the functions tell us when the two divisors are equivalent. And unfortunately, Weierstrass points are easy to work with while the others were not. Um, so that's the thing. That's what I'm studying currently is, is, is other routes to the same 
to the same results. And um, I would like to generalize this for higher spin and for other surfaces like client surfaces, which are um, a bit more complicated, but we can build them using Riemann surfaces. And um, hyperbolic geometry also plays a big role here since all the Riemann surfaces with genus greater than or equal to two, which is what we consider, they have hyperbolic geometry, same way as Rachel was explaining before, it's the same geometry. And um, we would like to apply this methodology for higher dimensions. And the end goal is to provide a dictionary in a way for physicists or whoever to use. So if they if they can, if they want to, if they have a, something in mind that's like, oh, I would like a surface that does this and that and that. I want them to be able to just look it up and it, the results are there for them, right? And that's why we're we're trying to classify these M spin bundles. And um, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Okay, thank you, John, that was fantastic. Uh, I'll, again, I'll kick off with the question. So, so I know you've started your PhD, so did your PhD naturally follow on from your final year project? Yes, incredibly naturally, yes. Yeah. And, and you seem to imply that you've got some new results uh i don't I'm not sure no it's it's more of a kind of a lack of uh i kind of have more results on um more of the of negative results i would say like we cannot do this or we cannot do that as opposed to yeah i i wouldn't say they're interesting yet I, because i've i've been trying to look at new ways to deal with this problem because um the ways that i used are not as powerful as I want them to be. And it, it's a much bigger task, again, because of the virus just So the hyperelliptic surfaces that we consider, they're very symmetric. They have so many, so many things going for them. And so it was so easy to work with that it's not the same way for the other surfaces. Okay, uh, would anybody else like to ask a quick question? You'd like to unmute yourself? Oh, Massimo. Yes, again, I'm sorry. I'm probably no, hearing okay. nuances from a an amateur clinician like me, um, what what would be the what would the, the practical application be of Riemann surfaces? Is there any uh, if there is any application or in real life? So um, Riemann surfaces are pretty much well studied because the thing about them is that when you have uh, complex functions which are everywhere um, in physics, especially is that those complex functions sometimes have, don't have um, a good definition for the output, right? So uh, uh, when you imagine a you, what you have an input and an output, mm -hmm. sometimes that output is not well-defined. So the output is two numbers instead of one, right? And so what they would do instead, instead of studying it on the complex plane, they would, they would instead study that same function translate it into a, a Riemann surface, and then the function is now better behaved. Okay. So the real life application, I don't, I'm not sure exactly, but if, if we're looking, the thing is it's very intertwined with geometry, Riemann surfaces. And the thing about geometry is as we realized, as mathematicians have realized in the, in the last few, I would say centuries is that there's lots of real life problems that might not look like geometric problems, but if you put them in a space, right, in a geometric space with like lots of, you know, let's say a Riemann surface, the problems might have easier solutions in that space. Okay. Same way I would say with Rachel and, and, and how she will put the knots on the torus. Okay. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have a question? No. Okay, um, Jean, I'll, I'll ask a final question then. So if you're thinking about you know, applications in physics and string theory, and we think about how many dimensions there are in our space, you know, so you can think of three, uh, three you know, X, Y, Z borders, yeah. but then you've got time, and so you might have like five dimensions. So yeah. With the spinners and the string theory, you know, how many how many dimensions have physicists, you know, physically got now in our universe? 
how many physicists um what they they conjecture you mean yeah well yeah well, what do they conjecture that the you know the dimension of the universe really is it it, it depends on who you ask but i've i've so when i when i first started when i i did a, a module in string theory and the first thing we started with was just how it progressed into like 24 dimensions or something now with with these other dimensions you know when you think about them the way they construct them is they're very small they're very compact and very, so that we cannot see them right but they're there to fix the laws of physics in a way to make sense of the way the laws of the the, the physics that we're seeing works they try to make sense of that by adding extra dimensions same way as when we first, when we thought this was three dimensional and the Einstein was like, well, maybe maybe it's four. And when we considered four with the time being an extra dimension, that made the physics a lot, make it a lot more sense. It made a lot more sense to how it was working our universe. So those, one of those extra dimensions or two of those extra could be a Rima surface. That's what it is. Okay, thank you, Jean. That that was very enjoyable. You can now relax. Thank uh, again, thank you for coming back and giving this wonderful talk. No problem. Uh, I enjoyed. We'll, it. we'll run a competition again next year, and perhaps you can give advice to to students. Thank you, Rachel, as well, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, the, the these the talks have been recorded, so if you know colleagues or friends who want to see the talks, you know the the, the recordings will be available. Okay, so Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Rachel. Merry Christmas, Jean. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. Bye-bye.